Hello and welcome to the Spike podcast. I'm Tom Slater, filling in for Fraser Myers, who's away this week. I'm delighted to be joined by two very special guests, Luke Gittos, a Spike columnist, a lawyer and director of the Freedom Law Clinic. Luke, thanks for coming back on the show today. Yeah, no problem. And joined again by Anaya Follerin, a man who is also a Spike columnist and a broadcaster. Coming up on the show, the prospects for Scottish independence. I speak to Kevin Newell about euthanasia in Canada, and we discuss all the latest from the Woke World Cup. So to kick things off, um, a big week in the story of the fight for Scottish independence, Scottish secessionism. So there was this ruling on Wednesday at the Supreme Court on the question of whether or not the Scottish government could legislate for a referendum, an advisory referendum, but a referendum nonetheless. Uh, a complete denial of that, really, from the justices there. Um, you had the President of the Supreme Court not only saying that they weren't able to do this, but also rubbishing a lot of their arguments surrounding the idea that Scotland was effectively a kind of oppressed <laughs> colony who had rights to self-determination and so on. But of course, there's loads of conversation now swirling around what does this mean for independence and so on. But just on the on the ruling, Luke, were you, were you surprised by what took place? Or was this always a kind of done deal, given the fact that Scotland is an intrinsic part of the union as a matter of law and constitution and so on? Yeah, I'm not sure anyone was surprised who knew about constitutional law. The decision was very short, mm. um, which does give you an indication that although it was a relatively complicated question, the answer was quite simple. Um, the Scottish government presented, as you suggest, um, a couple of key arguments. The first being that they had effectively the power under the legislation which gave rise to devolution to hold a referendum without Westminster consent. So that was the central question that the Supreme mm -hmm. Court had to rule on. And then there was an element um, of it in which the Scottish government argued that they were an, effectively an oppressed people under international law all of which were dealt with very robustly by the Supreme Court in rejecting it. And you do wonder that there's a lot of people saying that this was a very big waste of money. Mm. And you do think, well, if the Supreme Court dealt with it quite so briskly, someone must have advised the Scottish government in advance that that was the likely outcome. So I think there's a justifiable sense that this was a waste of time. Mm. I think it's very interesting, we'll probably come on to talk about this, but that this has been presented as a problem with democracy. So Ian Blackford coming out in PMQs and saying that this effectively illustrates that the UK is no longer a voluntary union. That seems to be the line parroted by Sturgeon, Blackford and, and SNP MPs over the last few days. Um, and it's just worth emphasising how hollow their appeals to democracy are. Firstly, there is very little evidence of a kind of groundswell mm. of support for Scottish independence at the moment. Reading Scottish writers over the last few days, the impression seems to be that the SNP have failed to build a popular consensus for what an independent Scotland would look like. The polling seems to be far from clear cut um, and doesn't take into account the fact that independence um, would be coming at a time of real global economic turmoil. So, the SNP haven't really thought out or argued for what independence would look like in this context. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are saying that this decision really is the cherry on the cake for their failure to convince the Scottish public that independence would be a good thing at this time. Mm -hmm. It's also just worth mentioning that their appeals to democracy ring so hollow when Sturgeon, Blackford and the rest of the SNP were key voices in trying to not carry out the Brexit referendum mm. vote. Mm. And although those two things are they're separate issues, it has been galling to see them now come very late to the party for popular sovereignty and say that uh, popular sovereignty should be what drives political affairs when they spent so long trying to overturn the biggest democratic vote in British history. No, I think that point's very well made. I mean, they don't even really believe in popular sovereignty in Scotland, given the fact they want to leave one democratic union and join one very anti-democratic union in the form of Brussels. But you're right, Luke. I mean, it's it's actually quite staggering um, in some ways. Maybe I was just um, taking the high status opinion for granted, the fact that it hasn't kind of shored up support for Scottish independence the intervening years since 2014. We've had Brexit, we've had Boris, we've had Tory rule, which is always good for the SNP. And actually after 2014, I think the thing that was being briefed out by the Scottish nationalists was that, you know, we've got to hit about 60% in the polls quite regularly before we go for this again. So you, you sense that they know that this case is, is quite shaky. But Anaya, what do you think? Because obviously, depending on who you read, it's a shot in the arm for independence. It's showing how, again, as Luke was saying, that the union is no longer voluntary. But I, you do get this creeping sense that actually 
their bluff is being called mm. and it's not obvious that they can follow through on it. What do you think is going to happen there? I mean, it is strange to me them saying, Ian Blackford and others, that it's example that it's not a voluntary union. When there was a referendum <laughs> in 2014, which uh, did show as a percentage higher than what the Brexit vote was, that actually the majority of Scottish people uh, did support continuing being part of the union. Now, of course, the SNP will argue that uh, the circumstances have changed and so on. But as we've just discussed, actually, according to a lot of the poll uh, data and so on, that it hasn't really shifted uh, significantly. And I think the SNP and Nicola Sturgeon would have spin, spun this result in their favour regardless, you know, if it was uh, a victory, which was unlikely in many um constitutional experts were saying that long before uh, the the announcement today, they would have said that, well, this is another step in the right direction for independence. And now that it didn't go their way, they're saying, well, this is an example of how, why we need independence, because this is not voluntary um, and so on. And I think one of the reasons why many Scottish people perhaps haven't uh, shifted significantly is because under the powers that the SNP already do have, there isn't this kind of radical, transformative uh, programme for Scottish people, whether that's democratically, but in the, the policies that they already have control over. You know, mm. there isn't this clear uh, vision um, to, to take uh, Scotland forward in a way that is genuinely meaningful and different. And also, so much of it is just based off of this victim narrative, mm. as was uh, alluded to, trying to frame themselves as this uh, oppressed uh, colony of, of the United Kingdom when Scotland has been part and parcel of the UK and very essential and impactful to the direction of this country, like to to and the, the union to suggest that Scotland is this uh, uh, victim, I think is a very degraded view of, of Scottish society and, and the Scottish people. Um, but on the other hand as well, I do think there still continues to be a problem of of Westminster and and people that lead the union as a whole for failing to uh, create a compelling defense yeah. of the union. And so this, this issue is not going to go away. They're mm -hmm. going to keep revisiting it until actually the kinds of arguments are made, which give meaning and authority to, to Britain uh, as a united uh, entity, which I'm not sure exists from the political class yet. Mm -hmm. And you made the point there about, you know, what this vision for Scotland would look like. And just putting that to you, Luke, what do you think, you know, Scottish independence even looks like now? What is it really about? Because we've heard a lot about we need to escape from Brexit. <laughs> we've heard a lot about how we're under the thumb of Tory rule and so on. But, you know, there's other than that, what do they what do the SNP really have if they are trying to appeal to the Scottish people and so on? Well, I think as we've as you've spoken about on this podcast before, the SNP have spent an awful lot of time on kind of culture war issues, Nicola Sturgeon, particularly with regards to trans rights. Um, and that has been at the cost of sort of fleshing out, I think, a real vision of what an independent Scotland would look like. I mean, looking at their policies, a lot of them seem dependent upon receiving additional funding from people like the European Union. Mm. And so before you even get on to dealing with the practical problems of succeeding from the union at a time like this, um, it's, it's far from clear the SNP have any idea about what independence is for. Mm. Um, and I think that's a real problem. And it's something that it's worth mentioning also that that is perhaps why the uh, push for the referendum has been so important to the SNP's project, because you do get a sense and reading some of the journalists writing on this at the moment, that this decision of the Supreme Court is quite terminal for them, because it means an, a sort of existential threat mm. and a, an end to their point of being mm. and they now have to if, if they are genuinely going to forget the fight for independence at least for the time being they have to answer the question of what they do next mm -hmm. it's worth remembering also that they are bringing this challenge through the supreme court because they have failed in their political project to build the political case for a second referendum so soon after the first one this was an attempt um, to circumvent the need to make their case politically. They hoped that they could use existing legislation and the Supreme Court to bring about the result that they wanted. Mm -hmm. And now that they've failed, they're going to have to answer, start answering some serious political questions about what their role is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you are struck with how, as I've been talking about, how negative that case for Scottish independence, such as it is, actually is at this point. I mean, it seems so much bound up with kind of anti-majoritarian sentiment, which kind of often takes forms of anti-English sentiment, really. You know, we're under the thumb of these idiots who vote for Brexit and so on and so forth. Um, there's a lot of this kind of faux historical grievance mongering that sort of takes place. And then also you think about what really they have defined themselves by domestically, apart from just, you know, failing on education, failing on healthcare and so on. It's this 
really sort of petty authoritarianism, you know, a desire to wrap their hands around any quote-unquote progressive agenda going, which are often quite authoritarian and so on. So you just think it's become, for all their kind of high-minded rhetoric, it's just this kind of bourgeois, technocratic, really unpleasant kind of movement at this particular point. It's probably no wonder that it's not really actually resonating with as many people as they like. But just finally, Anaya, I guess the, the question now turns to what happens. We've got we've got out of the law courts, now it's back to politics where it should be. Although you are seeing the SNP taking what seems like quite a risky and in many respects quite incoherent strategy of saying that the next election will mm. effectively be a de facto referendum on this question. Again, polls seem to suggest that most people in Scotland don't want that to be the case, but nevertheless, that's how she's going with it. What do you think happens from here? It's a big question, but at the same time, do you think that... Um, again, this is going to be a, a gamble that pays off? Or do, do you feel like things are starting to crack up at this point? I, I do think um, they are starting to to crack just because I think it was built on quicksand for the last few years anyway. But I mean, they will continually find an excuse and a manoeuvre to, to re-argue for that position. But there is speculation that in 2024, if uh, Nicola Sturgeon doesn't get the majority uh, vote for... Um, uh, the SNP, which she is claiming that she might position as a de facto referendum, that she might resign and someone else will then take over and come up with a whole new set of ways to, to make that case. But as you just mentioned, I mean, one of the things in Glasgow, some of the levels of addiction is huge. Um, oftentimes the largest in Europe, many of the uh, genuinely crippling kind of social issues affecting uh, Scottish society are being completely ignored and deflected in favour of, of um, this whole narrative around uh, independence. And independence is primarily uh, the, the narrative around it is, as you alluded to, just to differentiate oneself from England, uh, not uh, this horrible conservatives uh, that are you know, so right wing, where, where this kind of progressive utopia, whether that's on on green issues, on trans issues, um, etc. And I think I think it is very um, unfortunate for the Scottish people. But as the polls are showing that it, they may not get that and that may well um, mean that that would dampen their argument for hopefully a few years. And, and also quite remarkable, as you say, given how weak the pro-union argument was mm. even during that last <laughs> referendum. So who knows what will happen? I used to hate it when I cut myself shaving, but now I've started using Harry's, I never seem to have that problem. The Harry's Shave Gel does an incredible job of protecting my skin and giving me a smooth finish every time. And thanks to the Harry's weighted handle, I always feel in control, even when getting to those hard to reach spots. In these cold winter days, it's also important to make sure your skin doesn't dry out. That's why I've been using the Harry's Hydrating Night Lotion to keep my skin feeling fresh. Basically, Harry's just makes shaving effortless. By having a subscription, I never even have to worry about forgetting to buy my shaving gear. And if I want to adjust or switch up any of the products I get, I can always make any changes directly from my account page. Once you start shaving with Harry's, you'll never look back. The best way not to miss out is with a Harry's trial set which Spiked podcast listeners can now get for free. So make sure to support our podcast and start your own skincare journey by redeeming a free Harry's trial set. All you cover is the £3.95 for delivery. Just head to harrys.com forward slash spiked to have your trial set and night lotion delivered to your door. That's harrys.com forward slash spiked. Next up to Justin Trudeau's Canada and the alarming rise of medically assisted suicide there. In recent weeks, people around the world have been shocked by the case of Amir Farsoud, a 54-year-old disabled man who has opted to go on the medical assistance in dying program, the MAID program in Canada, not because he's got a few months left to live or a few years left to live, but because he's been kicked out of his house effectively. So to discuss this very alarming case, I caught up with Kevin Yule. Kevin is a Spike contributor. He's a Canadian by birth and he's the author of a great book, Assisted Suicide, The Liberal Humanist Case Against Legalisation. Here's what he had to say. So to kick things off, should we talk about this case in particular? How typical is it? Um, could you just tell us some of the details of this particular gentleman and the decision he's chosen to take? Well, uh, Mr. Farsoud, who is officially um, it, it suffered from a disability, and according to the change in the rules that happened 
a little ways back, he was allowed an assisted suicide or euthanasia, which is much more typically what people ask for in Canada. And his case came up, but it received a lot of publicity, which is interesting. It didn't even make a huge impact when it first came up. I mean, he is uh, 55 years old, I believe, or 54. And he suffered from a disability that gave him chronic pain. But mostly what he suffered from was poverty. And what happened was his landlord gave him notice because he wants to sell the property in which uh, Mr. Farsud is a, a shares uh, a house. And this was so depressing and, and awful for Mr. Farsud that he thought he couldn't cope. And therefore, he requested euthanasia. And the way that Canada works means that the, there is no obligation to exhaust every other possibility. So therefore, he was signed off by one GP who, who knew exactly what his situation was, and he was uh, seeking another signature. Fortunately, for, however, because his case was publicized, there was a crowdfunding, and he received sixty thousand dollars, which was enough for him to start out uh, and you know to resolve his problems. And it's interesting that sixty thousand dollars is approximately what is saved uh, by each euthanasia. So basically, uh, you can see that his problems were solved by sixty thousand dollars, which would have uh, you know. Uh, would have uh, been the savings that would have been made by his euthanasia. But his is just one of many kind of cases. So there's another one, Michael Fraser, who did go through with it. He was 55 years old. He was unable to pay his rent or to get outside. He was disabled. And he chose euthanasia and it was granted. So many people will say, oh, this is, this is you know, one or two horrific cases. But of course, if we were looking at, at uh, capital punishment, we don't say, ah, uh, well, this is just one case of, of innocence um, and we don't care that much. Mm -hmm. So it's this very blasé perspective on life that I think is, is happening in Canada and is being forwarded by the whole euthanasia agenda. And can you tell us a bit more about what the Canadian law is, uh, who qualifies and how it ended up um, in the place that it has? How long have these laws been on the books and how have they developed, I guess? Well, it's a, a fairly recent development in many ways. There was a court case in British Columbia of a woman who suffered from MS, what we would call MS or ALS in, in Canada. And she went to court to try and force the government to award her um, euthanasia. The BC court agreed with her and said that the federal government, in order to comply with the Charter of Rights, the Canadian Charter of Rights, had to actually grant euthanasia. So the judge ordered Parliament to change the law, which is, there's a whole other discussion about that relationship. Uh, but the key thing is that that happened in two, and, and in 2016, it was changed. The law was duly changed by the Trudeau government. And then uh, the following year, into you had a, a Quebec court who was faced with a situation where somebody who was whose death wasn't reasonably foreseeable, which was in the original uh, stipulation, the safeguard, so to speak, was that death had to be reasonably foreseeable. Already, that was pretty vague, uh, because it's sad to say all of our deaths are reasonably foreseeable, but. It, they removed that phrase. This judge ordered Parliament to remove that phrase. And therefore, there is what's called track two, which is people who have disabilities or conditions that cannot be alleviated and from which they feel that the suffering is intolerable. And that phase two, that track two, rather, is how uh, Mr. Farsud and Mr. Fraser were allowed um, assisted suicide. But finally, in in March 2023, uh, mental illness is being added. And that was also done through a bizarre criteria whereby a, a investigation was ordered, which is only reporting back in March. So already uh, they have uh, legalized it in, in essence, but they, they are delaying it so that they can study it. But of course, every study every bit of studying they've done has just simply underlined the need for euthanasia for mental illness. So Canada leads the world in terms of euthanasia. Within a few short years, it has expanded beyond 
all recognition. It, it, it's much, it's further ahead than, than the Netherlands or Belgium, mm-hmm. where it has been uh, legal for the past 20 years, in the sense that they, doctors don't have to actually um, give alternative give alternatives and don't can't uh, deny euthanasia on the basis that their alternatives exist. So it's a very comprehensive and fairly frightening regime of, of euthanasia that is now in place. And as you've written about for us, it's really is, if we don't, you know, we don't have to call it the slippery slope, but it's something like it insofar as now in, what was it last year, 3.3% of deaths in Canada being accounted for by this particular program and number kind of steadily climbing. And whilst people often dismiss that as a fallacy, it's, it's hard to dismiss the idea that this hasn't spread beyond the bounds that were originally um, given for it. But I mean, Kevin, I just wanted to pick up on the title of your book and the case that you make in your book is the liberal humanist case against assisted suicide, against this new form of euthanasia. I was wondering if you could just give us that case in a nutshell, if you like, given the fact that I think the opposition to assisted suicide is often associated with a kind of more conservative or often religious sort of opposition. Yeah, I mean, my opposition is, first of all, atheistic. It's based on a couple of things. First of all, that it's not necessary to change the law. So there are a few cases whereby pain can be alleviated, uh, but these are very, very few. Even by Dignity and Dying's numbers that they present, uh, about 1% of deaths they regard as being bad deaths. Mm -hmm. So there's no need to change the law. What it's driven by is a climate of fear. So they will present these terrible cases and make you fear that this is perhaps what you have in prospect if you don't uh, back this legislation. So I think it's it's not terribly necessary. This is why the hospice movement opposes it in a big way, because they actually witness deaths. And as they say, the vast majority of them are peaceful. So that's, first of all, it's not necessary. But second of all, it's wrong, and I feel immoral, to um, encourage, let alone assist a suicide. I think that's the problem. We are rightly horrified when people gather at the bottom of a tall building and yell jump to somebody who's uh, up at the top. Uh, We don't think that suicide is a good thing. And it's this principle of assisting a suicide. One of the interesting things that's come out of Canada very, very recently, in fact, in the last few days, is that the Minister of Justice, David Lametti, has admitted that this is all about suicide. And he's admitted that, that in fact, the laws actually allow people to kill themselves in a, in a more genteel way. And uh, what we're finding is that, for instance, there are more and more women who are coming forward for euthanasia. So it's increased. If, you, if we regard euthanasia as suicide, it's recru- increased fairly dramatically across every country where it's legal the suicide rates for women, which I think is a very, uh, you know, problematic development. But yes, my my um, my problem with with assisted suicide is not on the individual cases. It's, it's on changing the principle that we try to prevent suicide. Just finally, Kevin, before we let you go, what are the prospects, do you think, for assisted suicide making it onto the books in, in the UK on British statute? It's a debate that hasn't flared up probably for a couple of years, given that there's been a lot of other things to argue about in recent years in British politics. But what are the prospects, do you think, for these kinds of laws making their ways into the British law? Well, I think there are a couple of, of interesting things that are happening at the moment. First of all, there's there's an attempt to change the law in Scotland, and it's very difficult to see how that's going to go. It is a real fight. There's also an attempt on Jersey. Mm-hmm. I think, though, I, I'm optimistic that, that people can see if we have enough of a fight back here, and there is quite a bit of, of argument against, which there wasn't in Canada originally, and there is a significant group of people who are actually making a difference, who are arguing against, and it tends to be the disabled groups, not dead yet, for instance, who object that disabled people are being targeted for for euthanasia in a way that other people aren't and that they are being encouraged to suicide, whereas uh, many other people aren't being encouraged to, to kill themselves. And this another, you know, other groups include the hospice movement, 
uh, the, probably about the the uh, medics are split 50-50, although um, when you get to hospice doctors, they're about 90% opposed. So you can see that there is real uh, opposition, but it, it literally comes down to people speaking up about that, this issue that I think makes the difference in the UK and perhaps did in 2015 when we had a very comprehensive vote on it. I don't think in England and Wales that is going to happen in the next little while. But there is a possibility in Scotland, and all our eyes will be on Scotland to see uh, what people think there, mm -hmm. or what happens in the legislature, really. Sometimes the news can get you down. But whatever's happening in the world, you can always work on yourself. That's why I've been learning Spanish with Babbel. I love that feeling of making progress towards a goal. And with its focus on natural conversation, Babbel makes learning a language quick and easy. At this rate, the next time I go to Spain, I'll be fluent. That's because Babbel's 15-minute lessons are designed to be the most efficient and effective way to learn a new language. Babbel's lessons are created by over 150 language experts. You learn how to have real-world conversations, learning words you'll actually use, not just meaningless phrases. Plus, Babbel's speech recognition technology helps you to improve your pronunciation and accent. There are so many ways to learn with Babbel. As well as lessons, there are podcasts, games, videos, and even live classes with a language teacher. And with Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, and German. So start your language learning journey with Babbel today. Right now, Babbel is offering our listeners six months for free whenever you purchase a six-month subscription with the promo code SPIKED. Just go to babbel.com slash play and use the promo code SPIKED for an extra six months for free. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com forward slash play with the promo code SPIKED. Babbel, language learning that works. So let's turn to the big story of the week, really, which of course is, is the World Cup. Um, there's been a lot of controversy. There's been a lot of virtue signaling swirling around this particular World Cup finals. Also, you know, this week it does feel like the football's also taken over, which has been great, you know, a great result for England on Monday, as well as some upsets along the way, which have um, provided a, a nice reprieve from a lot of the political discussion. But um, look, it was striking just how much politics was swirling around this particular World Cup. Obviously, the decision to hold it in Qatar under slightly questionable circumstances, um, you know, evergreen allegations of corruption against FIFA, but particularly, let's start with the England team. There was obviously so much discussion about whether or not they were going to make a stand for their values. They ended up taking the knee, as they have done a lot in recent years. Um, but in the end, they opted not to wear their pro-LGBT armbands whilst they were before they were in the Iran game because they were threatened with a yellow card and so on. So has the kind of virtue signalling of Southgate's England just collided with the sort of reality? Or what, what have you made of all this? Well, I think that, yeah, I think that's exactly what's happened, isn't it? It's that the reality of being a sportsman has come up against being a woke totem. <laughs> and that's, a, you know, I, I think what this World Cup is showing us is that you should not go to footballers, perhaps English footballers, uh, for your moral leadership because you can't expect them to be consistent. I almost feel sorry for English footballers sometimes mm. because they are fundamentally commercial entities and they will um, do things and make decisions based on their commercial interests. And being um, enmeshed in the woke world it's very important to one's personal brand nowadays. But there comes a point where you think, well, sorry, Harry Kane, if wearing your armband leads to a, f a, a yellow card and that is sufficient for you to basically drop all commitment to your cause, then perhaps you're not the, the moral force that we thought you were. <laughs> and neither should you have to be. I, yeah. mean, I really do think mm. people should stop trying to use these people as vehicles for their own values because that's what fundamentally is going on here mm. when um footballers engage in these activities you have to remember that there is effectively an industry behind them guiding towards doing it i don't think it genuinely comes from them themselves and i think there's a reason why that's really sad it's because we lose sight of how iconic these young men are you know this england football team is a great team it's doing a fantastic job on the pitch. It's getting us further in tournaments than we have been getting for a very long period of time. You know, young men like Bakayo Saka, uh, Marcus Rashford, these are great, iconic football players. And they embody a lot of the values that we should be celebrating. Determination, resilience, you know, heroism, national pride. 
these people are good enough without having to funnel mm. artificial woke values through them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if you carry on doing that, they will be inconsistent. The other example was David Beckham, of course, yeah. who was at one point a gay icon and then it's now literally become the spokesperson for a part of the world that's openly homophobic. Mm. And, you know, you have Joe Lycett uh, <laughs> pretending. shredding his, sh <laughs> pretending to shred money and then shredding his copy of Attitude with David Beckham on the front. And you do think, what did you expect? Mm. If you're taking moral leadership from Premier League footballers who in many ways are literally embodiments of contemporary capitalism, you are not going to get moral <laughs> leadership and consistency. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. And as you say, it was kind of it was a role thrust on them, but at the same time, they were quite willing participants. I think it's fair to say. What is what is it, Anai, that makes you think that these people who you know the reason that we all idolise them is because they're great at football, mm. um, still feeling the need to engage in this kind of politics, seeing as it seeing it as a kind of moral mission, if you like. How did we end up in that particular? Yeah, position? I mean, there's clearly you know, as Luke mentioned, uh, you know, pressure from certain. Uh, organizations and activist groups for these uh, individuals to do that. But I think it also just drains the the genuine radicalism out of some forms of activism when it's just this kind of top-down uh, measure uh, that is really enforced um, rather than, for example, uh, the Iranian men who uh, seemingly quite spontaneously and, and it, with genuine risk mm. um, to themselves uh, back in their home country and so on, uh, did not sing the national anthem and, and did those kinds of things that were incredibly powerful um, and, and wasn't this uh, often technocratic, bureaucratic, top-down uh, measure to really uh, be seen to be good to the right people. Um, and, and so I think, I think in that sense, uh, that really differentiates what it really means to take a stand um, versus what we are seeing uh, today. But you also have to wonder, though, as well, a, a country like Qatar, or why they would want to open themselves up um, as a country where uh, so many people across the world are going to go there and with all of the different values and ideas and, and, and try and regulate people in all these myriads of ways that they have done. I do think it is also strange in that sense um, why, why they've wanted to do that. But of course, there's all of those arguments about it, corruption and so on. But yeah, I think this debate has been going on for quite a few years about football and, and, and politics. And I think it just goes back again to in 2020. I mean, this has been really a culture war um, and rather than actually politics infused in in football people should just enjoy the game we should but the first was two last things about the woke world cup <laughs> <laughs> i've got a question for each of you luke did you see the gianni infantino speech this is I the it, yeah. the president mm -hmm. of fifa we should we should probably play a bit of it today i feel uh, qatari today i feel arab today i feel african today i feel uh, gay Today I feel disabled. So pretty stunning comments there from Gianni Infantino launching into this very weird diatribe that lasted like an hour, apparently, mm. over the weekend. What did you make of that? Because if it was an attempt at woke washing, it didn't work because everyone was mocking it as soon as it came out of his mouth. But why did he decide to do this, do you think? Um, I mean, I really don't know. It was a truly extraordinary spectacle. I mean, I think there is sometimes when people are put in the position of having to appear woke, they can say some very strange things <laughs> because they genuinely don't understand what they're meant to say. Mm. And I think there's a lot of that going on. Um, I mean, football has never been the ideal fit for woke politics for, for, for all sorts of reasons. Um, and I think now when you have organisations like FIFA attempting to um, gloss over the real issues with corruption, holding um, the competition in somewhere like Qatar with these bizarre monologues, you really see how attempting to crowbar politics into um, mm. this kind of institution will not work and very probably end up looking stupid. Mm. I did like the bit where he suggested that Europe could learn from Qatar because they've opened their doors to migrants. Yeah, it's quite an amazing <laughs> bit. Oh, God. But, um, ju just to close out, and I'm not sure if you've seen this because it was from early today or from the day that we're recording this, but that a bunch of England fans, first of all, they were told by Kick It Out, the anti-racism organisation, that they shouldn't go dressed as St George because it would they would appear as crusaders and this would be potentially insensitive. But also we've since seen fans actually being turned away from the stadiums in Qatar by security, presumably for the same reason. So what do you make of this kind of alignment of 
sort of anti-racist activism in the UK and sort of um, Islamic monarchs oh <laughs> in the God. other case. What's this alignment about yeah, here? It, I mean, it's just so patronising. I mean, even when you're just talking about the monologue there, you know, naming all of these uh, supposed victim groups and presenting, you know, yourself as one of them uh, just because you've had a bit of backlash. But, you know, it, it, in in this instance, we are seeing once again um, something that has been repeated over uh, several years, the way that the uh, identity uh, victim hierarchy often creates quite strange alliances. <laughs> <laughs> it's so it's so stupid. It's so it's so frustrating. It's so bizarre. Um, and I think that I just feel very bad for the fans who get caught up mm. in this uh, pathetic politics on the part of these identitarians. Thank you so much for watching the Spikes podcast. We'll be back next Friday. If you hit subscribe and click the bell, you'll never miss an episode. And in the meantime, why not check out all of Spike's other videos and podcasts on this channel? And for more Spiked content, find us at spiked-online.com.